So, Dr. Wang, please tell us about your country. Thank you. Well, uh, I was asked by the Mr. Moderators to uh, introduce my country in two minutes. I find it's a mission impossible. So I give you one sentence about the uh, Taiwan. So what is Taiwan? I would say that it is so-called Oriental Switzerland. So if you know something about Switzerland, you know, already know something about Taiwan. Uh, well, we have about the same size of, uh, in, in terms of geography. Uh, in, your, in your case, in Switzerland, so you have a 40,000 uh, square kilometers. We have a 36,000 square kilometers. And in terms of landscape, uh, three, Fifth of the islands in Taiwan is occupied by high mountain. And of course, uh, the three fifths of your land is occupied by Alps, so the high mountains. And, and, and it's also very interesting that the, uh, our uh, GDP total is about the same size in 2021, except one thing is we are an island, you are inland, but you are surrounded by many, many strong countries. So pretty much about island anyway. <laughs> well, enough about Taiwan, let me, uh, I uh, started by expressing my gratitude to the Swiss MedTech to invi for inviting uh, Taiwan as a guest country this year to share our experience about the digital health technology. Switzerland is one of the leading countries in medical uh, technology, and Swiss MedTech days attract many top medical in industries and specialists from different countries every year. I'm very proud that Taiwan is part of this, such an incredible event. You know, Taiwan is also well known in ICD uh, manufacturing hubs. As you know that uh, roughly about half of our uh, chips is made in Taiwan and 92% of the most advanced chips are made in Taiwan that scale a lot of people, including the United States and China. Uh, well, Taiwan also has a very generous and equitable universal healthcare systems. Major Taiwan hospitals are working with the ICT company to improve healthcare through the digitalizations. The digital technology is extremely important to the post-pandemic recovery, and we wish to have international cooperations with countries who share the same democratic and liberal <clears throat> values. Switzerland is, of course, one of our priorities to work with. Now I have the pleasure to announce the Taiwan Digital Minister's uh, Audrey Tang will be the keynote speaker today. I am sure many of you are aware of her. She represented the Taiwan government to sign the de Declaration for the Future of the Internet in April this year. Uh, together with the United States, Australia, Canada, Japan, UK, and the EU and other countries in the world, we committed to build an internet environment where economic and social development is encouraged. Uh, later, our speakers in the Deep Divide sessions include Dr. Li Wei Chang, the Deputy uh, Superintendent of Taipei Venturing General Hospitals, Dr. Zhou Ye, the CEO of Asia Leading Medical Image of AI Companies, Dr. Grace Ye, the War Laureate of the Industrial Technology Research Institute, and Dr. Linus Gauss of the President of the Europe Taiwan Biotech Association. They are all top specialists from Taiwan, and I'm sure their speech will impress you about Taiwan's digital policy and cutting edge technologies. Last but not, but not the least, I wish to take this opportunity to appear for your support for Taiwan's participation in the World Health Organizations. Taiwan is highly capable, engaged, and responsible member of the global health communities. Taiwan would like to contribute more to improve global health care systems. Please give us a chance to prove Taiwan can help. I wish today's events a great success and thank you very much. Thank you. Ambassador David Wang, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wang. And now I'd like to introduce my co-moderator for this session, which is Dr. Sang Il Kim. He's an MD and PhD. He's uh, since recently at the Bern University of Applied Sciences. Initially, he's a radiologist, studied in Hamburg, spent several years with Siemens, eHealth Swiss, Swiss Post. He was also in the in the middle of the perfect storm of the digital transformation of the Swiss Federal Office of Public Health, BAG. His division had the task of setting up the electronic patient record in Switzerland and responsible for the management of the COVID pandemic. So he's not choosing the easy topics, uh, Dr. Kim. And uh, with our technical capabilities of today, even though there's four hours time difference, Dr. Kim will now have an interview with the Digital Minister of Taiwan, Audrey Tang. Welcome, Dr. Kim.
Thanks, Heiko, for the kind introduction, and thank you, Dr. Huang, um, for the short uh, insights of Taiwan. And I, I also hope that maybe this year could be the starting point for more uh, cooperation between Switzerland and Taiwan in terms of medtech and maybe health IT as well. So um, I'm very, very pleased that I can have here a virtual interview with the Digital Minister of Taiwan, Ms. Audrey Tang. And of course, we hope that we get some uh, ideas of their visions in Taiwan, their achievements, challenges, and also the obstacles they have introducing digital means to the healthcare area or to the society in general. Um, so I hope she is already online. Oh, yeah. Uh, I tried like you, sorry. <laughs> I know that you are a, a techie, a trekkie, and yeah. Uh, welcome, really thank you that you are here with us. And it's really a big honor um, to have this interview with you. And she's the digital minister since um, 2016, and uh, she shall help government agencies to communicate policy goals and managing information published by the government. So it's major topic is the communication between, you know, the governmental side and also the public side, and both with digital means. And she was the youngest minister um, in Taiwan without a portfolio. I was really astonished without a portfolio, so you could do everything what you wanted, right? <laughs> and, and, and so she has given the role to bridge the gap, and I think this is really interesting, to, be, uh, to bridge the gap between the older and the younger generation. And I think this is one of your everyday business uh, today. To be honest, while preparing this interview, I have seen some interviews on the internet and uh, yeah, and I can say I have become a fan of you, to be honest. Um, I really was uh, impressed by your clear thoughts and your very intrinsic motivation, I feel, to help all the people, that means really all young, old men, women, um, uh, every, everyone to use the digital means um, for a better life and also for a better environment, for example, also democracy. You stated once, uh, saving democracy with digital technology, and maybe we can hear about that something more. But to give you a word about your life, um, there are a lot of anecdotes about you, and um, I had, uh, yeah, I heard that about your quitting school, and maybe you can tell us why you quit school uh, at which age. Hello, really happy to be here. Uh, I quit school when I was 14, uh, on the second year of middle high. Uh, but I did so with the full blessing uh, from the head of my school. I discovered at the time that all the researchers are on new, this new thing called the World Web uh, in 1995. And I discovered this website called Archive, A-R-X-I-V, where people publish their preprints uh, for peer review before going to journals. And I write them, but people didn't know across the internet I was just 14. Uh, so I was treated as a peer of, uh, among researchers. So I told the head of my school, you know, if I can do research, I don't really want to stay in the school because the research is 10 years ahead of what I read in the school books. Uh, and then all my teachers and the head of school agreed. Uh, actually, the principal said, yeah, it seems like really exciting, so just just go for it, and you don't have to go to my school anymore. Uh, that is when I started uh, self-education and then started quite a few startups on web technologies shortly afterwards. Oh, thank you very much for this uh, history, uh, backside. Um, yeah, I think this shows also that you are doing things where you really believe in, and we hope also that we can learn a little bit about you, uh, from you, and also from Taiwan, uh, regards to the digitization of society, and especially here, digitization of the healthcare system. Well, to be honest, I was also astonished uh, when I read, oh, Taiwan has a digital ministry. Mm. Um, I thought, well, in Switzerland, I don't know if we have a digital ministry, not yet, I think. Then I uh, grabbed a little bit, and I um, realized also Japan has a digital ministry, and since this year, also Germany, our big neighbor has also a digital ministry, and uh, maybe this could be a key point for the digitization of society, to have someone responsible for that. Do you feel responsible for digitization of Taiwan? Um, in Taiwan, the word digital, shu wei, also means plural. 
like more than one, numerous. They share the same root uh, numbers. Uh, and so to me, uh, to quote Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president in her first inauguration speech, uh, she said, before we think of democracy as showdown between two opposing values, but from now on, democracy must become a collaboration between diversity of values. So plurality, collaboration across diversity, that is what shu wei, what plural or digital means in Taiwan. So uh, I feel responsible to build common ground out of very different positions and deliver innovations based on those common grounds. Very interesting. So um, I'm also one of the experts for semantic interoperability. And when I see and hear what you understand uh, uh, with the term digital, well, here it's, I think it's the opposite. We only see zero and one, and that's it, not plurality. <laughs> so very interesting. Okay, can you tell us maybe um, what was the reason that the Taiwanese government established such kind of ministry for digital affairs? Um, just like our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, the MODA, or Ministry of Digital Affairs, is a bridge toward the cyberspace. We realize that the cyberspace um, already has certain norms, internet norms. But we also realize that on the threats of the pandemic or of the infodemic, which is the word that the WHO used for disinformation crisis during pandemic times, uh, there are many norms that are being pushed backward. Many uh, democracies in our region especially feel threatened so much so that they want to do some takedowns of the internet, want to do some fragmentation of the internet, or just like they do lockdowns uh, to counter the pandemic. Now, maybe lockdowns are unavoidable if you have um, widespread community transmission before your um, hospital is ready for it. But in Taiwan, for the past couple years and a half, we've never had a single day of lockdown yet we managed to have net zero excess death uh, with regard to COVID. And we managed to have zero takedowns uh, for administration, uh, instead relying on humor to combat against rumor and the public notice instead of takedown against disinformation. So the Ministry of Digital Affairs wants to be, like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, a bridge to advocate this model, the Taiwan model of democracy toward emerging threats on the cyberspace Space, so that cyberspace continues to be a vehicle of liberal democracy or social democracy uh, instead of just bumping into authoritarianism or chaos. Thank you. That means social democracy needs so a digital society. Is it like that? So uh, in, yes. In... Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, I, I mean two things. First, as you said to introduce digital to improve our democracy. That's one, that's domestic, but also uh, to democratize the digital spaces that we are in. Uh, for example, in Taiwan, if you step into a public park or a town hall and so on, this is a very democratic space. We have referendum like you do, or we have public deliberation like you do. Uh, but if you go to, say, Facebook, uh, then you go into an authoritarian uh, regime and uh, ownership more than 51% is controlled by one person. Uh, so basically, uh, the democratization, the deliberation, everything uh, is gone uh, when you uh, have the conversation there. But in many jurisdictions, people don't have a digital infrastructure for public discourse. So they are forced to use Facebook for that purpose and therefore uh, go on a backslide when it comes to democratization to further instead say polarization. So democratization of digital spaces is as important as the digitalization of domestic democracy. Okay, thank you. Um, coming to the term um, digital society, well, for all of us as part of society, I think the health status is one of the key points for everybody all over the world. Um, is it right that also this healthcare environment is part of your work in this digital ministry? And if yes, what exactly are you doing or supporting or helping in this context? Yes, um, a couple of things. Uh, first, we have uh, this idea of collective intelligence. This is part of our three pillars of social innovation, fast, fair, and fun. 
Um, instead of Facebook, in Taiwan, we have our own civic infrastructure like this one, the PTT, that allows people to report around the turn of 2020, uh, on the last day of 2019, that there's uh, SARS cases reported from Wuhan. Uh, in many other social media that are more antisocial, uh, this news just got flooded by other news. But uh, in Taiwan's pro-social platforms that is part of our uh, digital affairs uh, concern, people triaged uh, this news very quickly, resulting in health inspections on the first day of 2020 because people contributed to the collective intelligence instead of being pulled away. The other thing that the digital ministry is interested in is to help the people who are not that used to online forums. Even though broadband is a human right, in Taiwan, there are still very young people or very old people prefer to call this toll-free uh, line number 1922 where they meet someone with a lot of empathy, listen to their cases, uh, their concerns, like in April 2020, a young boy called saying, uh, you're rationing out mask, I got pink ones, I don't want to wear pink to school, I'm a boy. Uh, then very next day on the 2 p.m. press conference, all the medical officers wore pink uh, and Minister <laughs> Chen said, Pink Panther is my childhood hero and all the fashion brands turn pink and so on. So this is not just about uh, biological, physical health. This is about mental health, about turning something that could be bullying or things like that into something that is humor driven and that takes the edge away. Okay, uh, you told us that you have some means to report things so that the health authorities and also you can um, uh, benefit from this information. To be honest, in the corona crisis, we also had several apps for that, but the people didn't use it. How do you manage that the Taiwanese people are using this kind of um, information technology to make these reports for better surveillance? Yeah, so it's about fast, fair and fun. Uh, we already had a lot of fun uh, before the pandemic using the same architecture uh, to report this information online. Uh, we have this line bot, it's like WhatsApp, uh, developed not by the government, by the civil society, civic tech, called COFAX, collaborative fact-checking so that people can report what rumors are trending and people share this dashboard of the most viral um, dashboard uh, of the disinformation or misinformation. So people um, just like reporting spam, but there is an element of competition there uh, because people want to debunk the disinformation as quickly as possible to, to win some points uh, in their peer base. It's like gamification. Uh, and the most active uh, dispelling of disinformation are then vetted by professional journalists on the third party um, fact-checking network like the Taiwan Fact-Checking Santa. And once they're vetted uh, by the journalists, uh, the participation officer, the people in charge of engaging the public in each ministry, rolls out these hilarious debunking packages that are even more viral than the disinformation. Before the pandemic, this is an example uh, that uh, people reported the trending virus uh, was um, the state will fine you $1 million for perming your hair many times a week. Uh, now, after just two hours, this picture gets posted by uh, the head of cabinet, our premier, Su Zhen Chang, that says it's not true. It quotes the mRNA of the virus. It's not true. Uh, then the spike protein that says, I may be bought now, but I will not punish people who look like my youth. And the fine print that says, well, we've introduced a labeling requirement for hair products. But then on the bottom, you see uh, our premier, as he looks now with no hair, uh, with a hair blower saying, uh, if you perm your hair many times a week, it will not damage your bank account, but it will damage your hair. Your hairstyle will match my hairstyle. Uh, this is is hilarious and it reached far more people than the disinformation and uh, empower people to share the clarification, the fact check and so on. So we already have that sort of civic crowdsourcing before going into the pandemic. So people is reasonably sure that if they surface something such as a new way, point out a bias, it will get a result in not 24 hours, in two hours. Okay, at least I've right now learned that we did only two things of your three Fs. We did it fast. We did it also fair in terms of uh, the Swiss COVID app. That was our con digital contact tracing app where, uh, where I was responsible for. Uh, but we didn't have the fun factor. And we also didn't have the gamification factor. Maybe this is what we should do the next time, the next crisis, the next crisis. Unfortunately, it will come, I, I, I guess. So thanks. Um,
Well, coming to Switzerland and digitization in healthcare, um, uh, I've uh, wrote this to you. Uh, to be honest, Switzerland is not that good in that topic. So we are quite poor in digitization and there's a ranking from 2018, maybe several people here know that. And we were placed in position 14 out of 17 countries here in Europe. So um, as far as I know, still over 50% of all doctors, physicians here in Switzerland are documenting on paper with a pen. I know that you once stated paper and pen was the first personal computer, but uh, hopefully this is not the fact for the healthcare, uh, healthcare professionals here in Switzerland. Do you know the situation in Taiwan? So are you working totally uh, digital? And, and if yes, still what kind of obstacles what kind of challenges do you have in the healthcare system uh, yes the entire uh, universal healthcare system in taiwan is digital uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, people cannot use uh, analog ways of inputting uh, this is important since you mentioned the contact tracing example. Uh, this for a while, for a year or so, uh, since mid-2021, is our uh, primary contact tracing system. Uh, it's based on SMS. So instead of installing any app, you don't have to install an app. This is a built-in camera. You just point it to the QR code. It pops out 1922, the toll-free number, uh, and you send a 15-digit random code, and that's it. Uh, that's all the check-in requires. The point I'm making is that introducing a new app usually just exclude 20% of people because we know 20% of people, although they can use a phone and the building apps, they do not have the expertise uh, or uh, they feel insecure about installing new apps. Uh, but the flip phones also important. So you can look at the 15 random digit, manually text that to 1922, and that still counts as a check-in. So again, that includes like 10 more percent of people. And all of them can go to a website to see which contact tracers have looked at their records in the past 28 days. Uh, so again, a reverse accountability, reciprocal transparency. Now, with this in mind, uh, it means that even people who do not carry any feature phone or anything at all, um, they can work with people who are nearby, who accompany them. At the end of day, they can still uh, write on a piece of paper, but at least people can build a ladder of expertise of a little bit more, uh, learning a little bit more and assisting people. And once people see that uh, if they take their IC card to the local convenience store, they don't know how to operate a kiosk to pre-order the mask or get a vaccine or uh, get a rapid test and so on. Um, and in these cases, the people in the convenience store can help them uh, to take their card to uh, point and click on the kiosk. Uh, but even my grandma, who is almost 90 years old now, after a couple of times of pre-ordering mask, uh, she also remembers what to click on the kiosk. And so she can teach her friends in their 80s and 90s afterwards. So the point first is to have an assistive intermediary, the pharmacist, the convenience store staff, and second, to always design with a maximally inclusive way so that people even with just a flip phone and so on can also learn something and then to them it's a little bit better than paper then. Mike? Yes. Okay, I see that uh, you are interpreting the fair part much broader than we did. Yeah, so you are much more inclusive. The, the targeting all the people, um, as I said in the beginning, old, young, and uh, also well professional and not well professional. Okay. Um, but coming again to the healthcare system in Taiwan, do you think that the digitization of the healthcare system in Taiwan is perfect? So, what are the downsides, in your opinion, of the current situation? One maybe small question, do you have a kind of a national electronic health record for every mm -hmm. citizen? Yes. So we just mm -hmm. tried right now here in Switzerland, mm -hmm. it's called Elektronisches Patientendossier. Mm -hmm. I think not all of you know that. Uh, it is already established. You can have one if you want, but uh, yeah, uh, we mm -hmm. have only, I think, 40,000 and that's it for the whole population right now. Yeah, in Taiwan, uh, in 2003, we had our SARS uh, epidemic. 
uh, at the time only a very small part in our country, uh, the Penghu or Pescadores Island, is piloting the electronic records uh, and the IC card for universal healthcare. Everybody else, um, including like everyone in Taiwan or Jinmen, Mazu, uh, and so on, uh, are using those paper-based cards with paper-based records that are, um, uh, well, the good word is federated, but really dispersed <laughs> uh, among all the different his uh, systems in all the clinics and so on. Now, um, after SARS, I, I think people wake up to the fact that without such uh, databases for, as I mentioned, reverse accountability for ledger and so on, uh, in terms of epidemic control, you would like be fighting blind uh, because there's no way to get real-time access to the information and to get information to people. Uh, and so people generally agreed that uh, we need to have a national healthcare database. But uh, the constraints, the human right prevent, the, the human right abuse prevention, sorry, uh, the data protection and so on are paramount. So we held a citizens' deliberation uh, assembly with statistically representative uh, uh, people um, to just deliberate uh, on the parameters of this. So it's rolled out 2004, 2005. Now, uh, in the 15, 16 years since the establishment, we have not had a single uh, major incident cybersecurity wise or privacy wise. So it's very much re relied upon. So by the time that we re encountered the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, we basically uh, increased the reach of the universal healthcare system. It didn't used to, for example, uh, link to the immigration records, but now it's linked so that the clinic can see whether you come from a place that was more COVID than Taiwan around 2020, or it's also linked, as I mentioned, to mask availability, purchasing, rapid test purchasing, like everything. So it used to be just medicine, healthcare, uh, but now it's just generalized uh, pandemic control. Uh, of course, there are also concerns uh, that whether this is going beyond the scope of the originally agreed upon by the citizens' deliberation design of the universal health care system. There are constitutional court uh, debate currently happening of whether we need to allow opting out of the future data use because the original social contract was no opting out. So that is still being uh, deliberated. I'm sure that we'll continue to find a delicate but fine balanced uh, norm around data availability and privacy concerns. Okay, what I see here, two things, is that was there was a crisis which gave the thing a push in your country, and the other part is that um, there's a big trust from your people to the governmental infrastructure like this national health record system. And uh, I was uh, responsible for digital transformation the last two years at the Ministry of Health here in Switzerland, and I was asked several times, will this crisis give us also a push in digitization and to be honest, I can't see it right now, not yet, maybe in the next years. Some new legislation are, um, uh, are prepared right now for the near future. But still, what I realize is digital transformation needs change management, changing the habits of the people, because new tools make new processes, new work, new collaboration. Also, digital transformation needs more money and more investments. And maybe a question to you, are you, do you know how many, uh, uh, how much finance you have put in, how much money you have put in into your system for the digital transformation the last years from the governmental side? Mm -hmm. uh, that is a really good question. Uh, we, for the first time uh, in the Tsai Ing-wen's first term, our president, uh, classified digital as a kind of infrastructure budget. Uh, this is important because previously in the Taiwanese accounting system, uh, and I uh, think many other accounting systems across the world, only things that are concrete, like literally made out of concrete, uh, count as infrastructure budget. Uh, and uh, usually the investment uh, or the capital expenditure uh, is not extended to things purely made out of bits. Uh, but by including the uh, digital infrastructure as a kind of infrastructure, 
uh, we made sure that this is not just about the concrete things, but rather about the bits in general and the data pipelines and things like that, that become uh, very important. So we put in, I think it was 87 uh, billion uh, NT dollars over four years on the first term of the uh, President Tsai Ing-wen into the digital public infrastructures and a huge difference did it make. Uh, previously, we have silos. Uh, we have a lot of records, for example, uh, for disaster prevention, for earthquake mitigation, for flood control, for air pollution uh, and water level and water pollution and so on. But they're all in different universities, different agencies, uh, different civil tech communities, but by saying that the sensors, of course, is already there, the computation power is already there, but the uh, data pipeline that connects them together uh, are the infrastructure that we are investing in. We make sure that the machine learning models, the transformer models, and things like that become a common good uh, that people can apply across disciplines. Uh, so I think uh, this is definitely a idea that is worth spreading to more accounting offices uh, around the world that this is both operational expense but also capital expense. Okay. Uh, well, in my former role, I also was uh, responsible to establish a digital transformation strategy for the Ministry of Health, but also for the health system here in Switzerland. And I realized that uh, we are lacking a lot of interoperability, as you mentioned, all the silos which are there in different agencies, in different institutions. And uh, if we would try to connect them today, to be honest, we are not allowed to do that by, by law. It's not a lot because of data privacy issues, but if we would change the law and we would try to connect them, they are, we are still lacking uh, technical and semantical interoperability standards. I've heard that you are pr promoting these open API standards. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how you are going to combine these different kind of data silos? Yeah, certainly. Uh, for example, this is uh, some Arduino or Raspberry Pi boxes in all our primary schools that measures the PM 2.5 uh, air pollution levels so that the students can inform their parents whether they want to go for a hike or stay at home. Uh, and this has been civic tech, like not at all government infrastructure. Uh, but because this is part of basic education, some people start to find, for example, in the industrial area around Xinju, uh, there's actually a, a small gap there because the teachers are not allowed to break and enter the industrial areas uh, to install the sensors. Uh, and so uh, they work with us uh, on uh, such topics over the years through this annual uh, competition called Presidential Hackathon. Uh, in Presidential Hackathon, more than 200 teams each year propose their ideas corresponding to one or more of the 169 Sustainable Development Goal targets. Now, these SDG targets are voted in by the people using quadratic voting, a new voting method, uh, and the top 20 uh, gets this boost of three months of in internal sandbox of trying out their idea, as I just mentioned in a region, in basic education, or things like that. So people try out, for example, using FHIR, FHIR, to connect the ambulance and the emergency response unit in the Ministry of Interior uh, to the Ministry of Health and Welfare uh, in the major trauma units in the nearby hospitals. Uh, and actually, later on, it gets connected to the road planning agency of the Ministry of Transportation and Communication to optimize uh, the red light or whatever design of the road. And that's very different data norms. Uh, and to link them together, you need to procure systems that take care of not just the people using the system, which for a uh, ambulance system is probably people in the Ministry of Interior and Health instead of uh, people in the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, but rather, we say in our procurement uh, for any interactive parts, you need to offer it also in machine readable and writable format, the open API standard by the Linux Foundation. If you don't, if we, uh, the procuring agency tick the box, if you don't uh, implement that or charge a lot more to implement open API, then you could be disqualified as a vendor from future procurements just like we, we use the same language, just like refusing uh, to implement uh, uh, seeing disability, right? The uh, universal access for people with seeing difficulties. So you cannot discriminate against robots. That's the basic uh, idea of the procurement. And once all the systems are procured this way, then it becomes possible to link them together. Of course, just like the Estonian X road, we call it the T road, uh, it's 
still uh, maintains a full ledger of the access and for privacy, uh, like private identifiable information, we use instead multi-party computation, federated um, oblivious storage, uh, homomorphic encryption to make sure that we can share the insight or the computational model, but not necessarily the raw data. Okay, impressive to be honest. Um, yeah, maybe this a similar kind of infrastructure we will have also in Switzerland, as far as I know. The government uh, today here in Switzerland is, is going into that direction that at least the governmental bodies and the governmental IT infrastructure could and should lo look like that, what you just showed. Uh, as you know, we are here at a Swiss MedTech uh, event, so medical devices, mobile devices also for healthcare delivery and as well as software, mobile apps for healthcare delivery. Short question, are you using a mobile device for healthcare or some software for that? Um, yes, in an extended sense, right? I popularized the use of medical for uh, psychological um, consultations. Uh, previously, it was not possible uh, for people in Taiwan in the psychiatrist or counseling profession uh, to operate uh, throughout the internet because there's a law that says uh, it need to be done in the designated place. Uh, but then we creatively reinterpreted it uh, so that anything uh, a, a counselor's computer connects to is also interpreted to be in the same place. Uh, and so that extended uh, the reach of things. So yeah, I have on my phone uh, Far Hugs, uh, which is uh, like hugs from remote, uh, a, a psychological counseling tool that I personally help to interpret into existence. OK. Um, maybe you know that there's this GDPR, uh, the data privacy regulation here in Europe. And as well, we have a new medical device regulation which is uh, effective from this year on and last year on. And it's, it's a quite a big hurdle to jump over here for the medical device companies. Um, do you know how the quality assurance is done in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. So regards to yes. medical software, mm -hmm. regards to medical devices. Mm -hmm. And what my personal opinion is, especially for the software, these medical device regulations is not really fitting. Mm -hmm. What's yeah, your I, opinion on that? Uh, yeah, I think the, the latest, uh, well, one of the later uh, Apple Watch models that doubles as a kind of diagnostics uh, device uh, was the first public case um, that received a lot of scrutiny uh, from our Ministry of Health and Welfare in terms of uh, its use as a kind of medical uh, device, but it pertains, I'm sure, uh, not just for the software analysis part, but also to the hardware like the IoT uh, sensors there, like whether it's reliable uh, in terms of making self-diagnosis and so on. Um, in Taiwan, uh, although our privacy law is broadly compatible with the European model, uh, we do not have full GDPR adequacy because each ministry is its own data protection authority. We do not yet have a single DPA. Uh, that uh, scopes over all the, dif the different ministries. So basically, the Ministry of Health and Welfare get to be the DPA uh, and decide uh, the norm and the privacy uh, interpretations, which tend to be, of course, more strict compared to the interpretation, for example, from the Environmental Protection Authority that you just saw on the air boxes for very good uh, reasons. Uh, so yeah, I think in Taiwan, we think of data norms or privacy norms not as a one-size-fits-all thing, but rather to look at them like we don't have a text norm, right? There's a journalistic norm, there's an academic norm, and in different academic fields, different norms about their papers and so on. So just like there's no one-size-fits-all text norm, uh, we think the data norm is broadly aligned with whatever textual norm uh, that is uh, the ministry or the competent authority to say. Now, with that said, uh, not all ministries have the supervisory and regulatory capabilities uh, to express their requirements as software code. If they do, like our Financial Supervisory Council, which uh, successfully expressed its anti-money laundering uh, and KYC, know your customer, uh, like if you uh, try to open a bank account or sign insurance with uh, old people, there are certain steps that you need to ensure that they are fully informed and so on. And once those rules are expressed as computer code, it becomes very easy for the compliance units in the banks to just plug and play that particular model 
module in their software uh, instead of a black box that seeks certification afterward. I think we should establish a, a modular uh, computer code readable reg legislation and regulation uh, so that it's not uh, we want to do evil. Uh, we do not do evil, but rather cannot uh, do evil. That is the direction we're working forward to. Okay, thanks for these insights. Um, one of the big challenges uh, right now in the healthcare area is the usage of data. We mm -hmm. have so many tons and billions and trillions, trillions of data in different data, data silos, which we can't access, which we can't use, for instance, for research purposes. Last year, we had here the Finnish delegation here and the fin and Finland Establish um, a secondary use of healthcare data act two years ago. They were the first, uh, first I think, in the world to have a dedicated act for that. And uh, do you know the situation in Taiwan, or maybe you can tell us how kind of secondary use using healthcare data for research? Mm -hmm. How is it possible? And mm -hmm. what do you yeah you know, the, on that? yeah because uh, each ministry is its own DPA. Uh, the Ministry of Health and Welfare simply interprets uh, research based on the total data of national health insurance, uh, legitimate altruism, public benefit, uh, as simple as that. Uh, so not only there is no opting out from the universal health care, there is currently no opting out uh, from using it in secondary research. Uh, so we, we are at the other end of the spectrum, uh, like a very um, social uh, thinking, a very uh, collective thinking of of data. Now, uh, that is helped, of course, by the fact that we've never had a privacy or cybersecurity breach uh, in the past 15 years, so the trust is high. But even so, I think the Constitutional Court, encouraged by the GDPR, is now uh, deliberating. In a couple months, we'll have an interpretation uh, whether uh, that we should still allow some sort of opting out or whether uh, that the use of such data need to be additionally protected by, as I mentioned, zero knowledge proofs or multi-party computation or homomorphic encryption in order to qualify, continually qualify for this no opting out status. It's really opposite of our situation here. Okay, I didn't know that. Well, unfortunately, we're coming to the end. Um, and for the last questions, I would, we would like to hear from you. Maybe you have some recommendations for such uh, underdeveloped countries like Switzerland in terms of digitization in healthcare. So mm -hmm. what is your recommendation to us here in Switzerland? How could we reach a little bit more uh, better digitization in healthcare? Yeah, I think uh, Switzerland uh, leads the world uh, in deliberative and participatory and direct democracy. Uh, a lot of our work in Taiwan has been working with uh, the European researchers on digital democracy to bring some of your techniques and processes uh, into the digital realm so we can figure out the norms together. In 2015, our first use of the open space technology deliberation online uh, using POLIS, P-O-L.I-S, shows that for the UberX case, which is people without professional license, driving to work and back, picking up strangers, charging them for it, um, my social media uh, friends and families are all over the place. Uh, they don't know whether to call it sharing economy or people call it gig economy. Uh, there's a lot of uh, contest uh, in the space. But we deployed assistive intelligence or AI to help people after seeing the open data, the facts, to share not their final voting, but their reflection, their feelings. Uh, and there's no right or wrong about feelings. And after three weeks of running the police ideation, we only hold to our uh, self into account to answer the 10 most resonated feelings across different um, groups uh, and use that as the basis for ideation and finally regulation. So for example, I feel that passenger liability very important. If you agree, you move toward me. You click agree, you move toward me. If you click disagree, you move farther away from me. But there is no reply button, so there is no room for trolls to grow. Uh, but rather, people just keep posting their own ideas, 
feelings to resonate with one another, knowing that only the nuanced ideas that speak to the entire population, enabling collaboration across diversity, has a chance to be heard. So um, in mainstream media, you see divisive statements, polarization. But on the polis system, we only see the common grounds, like registration, not undercutting existing meters, insurance, and so on, which we very swiftly turn into legislation. So Uber is a legal taxi in Taiwan, but uh, the same multi-purpose system also enable local churches, local temples in underserved areas, in rural areas, to form their own fleet, uh, sometimes from long-term health providers and so on, which also earns tourist money and so on, in a way that benefits everyone. It's a plurality uh, solution. It's not a singularity solution to this situation. So I will encourage you uh, to uh, build such a norm building layer, combining the aspects of the face-to-face -face analog deliberative democracy that you excel in the world, as well as the digital way to record and amplify those norms so that we can actually agree on uh, the, some common points around privacy, around accountability together, and to enable small-scale pilot studies to be scaled into national scale like our presidential hackathon. OK, that means ask the people a user-driven approach for also better digitization in healthcare. Well, mm -hmm. we will think about that. Thanks. So um, I have to say goodbye. It was really a big pleasure. Thank you for the inspiring interview. I hope also here the audience enjoyed your views and opinions. And as you do it like that, I say live long and prosper. Peace and long life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Audrey Tank. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for the great interview.